<laughs> All right, let's uh, take a seat. Uh, get started. All right. So last week uh, uh, we looked at the incompressible potential flow around an airplane, and we started uh, uh, zooming in from the very far field to a little bit closer to the airplane. And uh, during the process, we learned uh, several important tools. So the first important tool we learned is how do we infer the pressure field if we know where the vortices are, right? And it's actually a two-step process. The first step is if you know where the vortices are and how strong the vortices are, you would be able to calculate the velocity distribution. Right, so that's what you did in the homework you just uh, uh, submitted last week. And from the velocity distribution, you can then calculate the pressure distribution, right? And that's using Bernoulli, right? If we know the flow field has even a certain region of zero vorticity, then you can basically trace a uh, a thread across the region with zero vorticity and you know the stagnation pressure would be constant along that thread, right? So using that, you can calculate uh, the pressure from a vorticity distribution, right? So so basically, for example, if we know the, uh, the vortices are concentrated on these two strong vortices, you would be able to compute the velocity magnitude and wherever the velocity has large magnitude, you are going to see uh, it has a, a small pressure, low pressure, right? And uh, just uh, to emphasize again, this is under the assumption of like zero vorticity mm -hmm. in the region where you are assuming you, you are knowing constant uh, stagnation pressure, so no vorticity. Incompressible flow, as we are going to go uh, later into compressible flow, we are going to see that uh, uh, this statement still holds, but uh, the definition of stagnation pressure has to change a little bit. And three is a lot of uh, what people miss is we have to assume a steady state flow, right? If the flow is unsteady, uh, changes as a function of time, the statement uh, doesn't uh, hold true anymore, okay? So the velocity has to be the velocity in the frame of reference when the flow field is steady state. Okay, so this is the first uh, uh, tool we have learned is how to infer pressure from vorticity. And we're going to use this tool today. The second tool we have learned uh, when we zoom a little bit further into the uh, airplane is how do we infer vorticity distribution from the geometry. And today we are also going to exercise that. And uh, this is actually part of the homework assignment uh, uh, that's due this week, right? That is uh, basically closing the loop. Uh, uh, I think it's the simplest exercise you, you can do uh, by hand to close the loop from the geometry to the vorticity distribution, right? Uh, and uh, if you look at the homework, you're going to see that uh, we actually have a minimum number of unknowns, just the two unknowns, right? In a typical calculation, there are maybe tens and often hundreds of unknowns, right? But in the case where you only have two unknowns, you should be able to by hand close the loop from a unknown set of vorticity distribution, right? Compute the induced flow on the wing, and from the induced flow uh, on the wing, you compute uh, uh, what is the angle of attack, what is the lift, what is the vorticity distribution on the wing, and therefore going back, closing the loop to figure out what is the vorticity distribution on the wing, right? And you form a closed set of equations you solve to actually get the vorticity distribution. So this is another tool we are going to use today when we further zoom in into the airfoil, right? Uh, the task today is to further zoom in from the length scale of the span to the length scale of the cord. And we are going to be combining uh, the two inferences, right? Inferring the vorticity distribution from the geometry and then infer the pressure distribution from vorticity. And therefore, as a result, we can infer the pressure distribution from the geometry of the airfoil. 
if we know the geometry, uh, if we know the pressure distribution, we know everything. We know what is the lift, we know what is the drag, we know what is the moment, right? Is it pitching down or pitching up? So this is what we're going to be doing today. All right, any questions on that? Okay, let's get started. So we'll first think about now when we zoom in, right? We are no longer thinking about the whole wing having a single bound vortex that threads across the inside of the wing and they typically assume that to be on the quarter cord, right? We now look into detail of the geometry. And what do you think is the vorticity distribution when you zoom in? Okay, we no longer think about uh, the vorticity being a single one, right? So where are there non-zero vorticity if you think about the whole thing? Yeah. At the tip, right, so we see the streamlines, uh, uh, the flow starts to turn, right? So yes, there is vorticity on the tip and uh, uh, in the wake of the tip. Where else there are vorticity, yeah? Well, around the whole surface. Around the, on the whole surface of this airplane, right? So a, a, as we zoom in, uh, we now start to consider the wing as a solid geometry. So on top of the wing, because it's a, a solid, uh, like the flow has to satisfy the non-slip condition, right? So the velocity exactly on the wing is going to be zero. But even a little bit further away from the wing, right? When you go outside of the boundary layer, the velocity is probably on the order of magnitude as the free stream, right? So that tiny uh, distance and a large velocity change means there is a lot of vorticity very, very close to the boundary, right? So I would say that where for high, uh, for low viscosity, high Reynolds number flows, the location of vorticity can be thought of uh, as extremely close to the surface, like an extremely thin layer close to the surface, plus an extremely thin layer downstream of the surface. Right? These are the places where there are non-zero vorticity. And can somebody tell me, uh, think about in three dimensions, what is the sign of the vorticity? Right? What is the direction of rotation of vorticity? So, so we, we already started in the previous lecture that what is the sign of vorticity in the wake, right? So if, the, if you look at the, uh, the direction of the flow, it goes this way. So the vorticity would be, uh, well, it's very hard to see like what's happening over here because uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't tell you uh, what occludes what, but the uh, the flow we know would rotate in such a way if the vertical direction is the direction of the lift. Therefore, if you use your right hand side wall, right, the vorticity would uh, uh, point into uh, the trailing edge from here. So this would be the direction of uh, vorticity in the wake. But now we are starting to consider the vorticity on the geometry of the airplane, right? What is the direction of vorticity on top of the uh, surface? Hmm? Yeah, it would be inboard. Would be inboard, right? right? Okay, so it is completely correct uh, when you think about the vorticity over here. It's because if you think about the very thin layer, right, just uh, let's imagine we are zooming in into here. On the geometry, there is no flow and a little bit away from the surface, there is flow, right? So if you think of the velocity having a gradient, I'm exaggerating the height here. Actually, the height would be very small. So uh, high velocity, low velocity, so the rotation, uh, the rotation goes like Oops, the rotation is like that, right? And as a result, the vorticity would point in this direction. Now, <laughs> interesting question is, how about on the part of the surface we didn't see? 
How about underneath, on the pressure side of the、uh, wing? The vorticity would actually point in the opposite direction, right? Because underneath of the wing, so let's imagine we can visualize underneath of the wing.、Uh, the velocity would be again zero here, but uh, going uh, at a faster velocity underneath, and the rotation would be opposite. And as a result, the vorticity would point this way, right? Okay, so now let's actually、uh, think about from a conservation of vorticity point of view, right?、Uh, from a conservation, basically from the the fact that、uh, vorticity cannot have any divergence in the sense you draw a control volume, the amount of vorticity flowing into the control volume has to be zero. So we know that from our previous analysis, if this vortex integrates. So if this vortex integrates into basically omega n ds right over this surface, has a total circulation of gamma, right? Then, from the conservation point of view, if you draw another phase that,、uh, if you draw a contour that encompasses that goes around a cross section of the wing. And then you connect this contour with that contour and form a, a control volume. Then the flux into the control volume of total vorticity, which is equal to the circulation, has to equal to the flux of vorticity out of the green phase, right? Which is the circulation around the green line. Agreed? Yes. Again, what's your control volume? So my control volume is. A volume that is composed of three parts. One part is the、uh, a small volume that encompasses the trailing vortex. The second is a surface that、uh, that is the cross section of the wing, and the third part is a surface that connects this surface with that surface. So the inside of that is my control volume.、Mm -hmm. Right? Makes sense. Okay, so so if I draw such a control volume, the influx from this space is gamma, right? And uh, uh, the third phase that connects these two has almost a zero vorticity, right? So I, I'm assuming like I have a rectangular wing where the lift uh, is uh, uh, pretty uniform, so that the concentration of vorticity is on the trailing edge, right? That comes out. So if that's the case, then if I connect the red with the green, then the connecting phase actually has almost no vorticity going in or coming out, right? So then the total flux of vorticity over the green has to be also equal to. So the circulation around it has to be also equal to gamma. Okay. Now, if you think about. Integrating、uh, the vorticity flux on this cross section, and we know all the vorticity is on the surface, right? If you if you go around the surface, we have a lot of、uh, vorticity that's in the boundary layer. But the vorticity above and the vorticity below are opposite signs. So what does that mean? That means the vorticity on the top of the surface, right? Has to integrate to a higher value than the vorticity, which is in the opposite direction on the lower part of the surface. That also means that the amount of、uh, vorticity, right,、uh, up and down, even though they cancel out, the residual after canceling out is going to be as large as the trailing edge vortex. Right, as large as what we know,、uh, what, what we have been thinking about in the Kuta-Jakovsky theorem, right? So basically, that's the、uh, that actually、uh, equal to the lift per span、uh, divided by rho v infinity is going to be just the leftover of the cancellation of the vorticity on top and on bottom. 
right? So let's go to the next. Uh, uh, so so basically, if you think about uh, all these uh, vorticities, so uh, on top and uh, on the bottom of the airfoil, and uh, we are drawing all of them in the kind of a, a counterclockwise direction, just to show that we are assuming this direction to be like positive vorticity, but in reality, the vorticity over on the top of the surface will be negative. Well, I just put a negative sign over here, will be negative. So these are actually going to be rotating in the clockwise direction, right? All the way to the stagnation point. At the stagnation point, uh, uh, the vorticity would be zero, and uh, on the lower surface, the vorticity would be uh, plus, right? And then the total integral of vorticity is going to be equal to whatever that comes out of the kura jokowski theorem. Okay, yes? Can you say again? Yes, so, so the total integral, so the question is, is it possible that the, uh, the integral vorticity would go into the other direction, right? Yeah. Yes, so so we know that the integral of vorticity, so the integral of vorticity uh, n, which is in the in the normal direction uh, ds, is equal to the circulation, right? So if you draw a contour around the wing, so that's the circulation, and that's equal to the lift uh, per span divided by rho v infinity. So the total circulation depends on the direction of the lift. So, yes, so if you have an angle of attack that goes, uh, if the free stream goes like that, the airfoil produces a negative lift, then what happens is that the plus, the positive vorticity over here would actually be more than the negative vorticity on the upper surface. Yes, and in that case, the uh, vorticity would uh, point in this direction, and uh, by the conservation, by the uh, control volume, the vorticity coming out of trailing edge would actually point uh, towards the uh, towards the tail of the airplane, right? And uh, it would create an upwash instead of downwash. Yeah. So for a symmetrical airfoil, like there's no lift generated, there would be no negative vortices. Exactly. For symmetric airfoil at zero degrees angle of attack the vorticity up and down would be exactly equal, right? And the integral would be exactly zero. And uh, yes, there would be no trailing edge vortex coming out, right? All right. Okay, so this is a, a, a motivation for saying that whatever vorticity we have considered in the previous lectures, right, I actually just the... Uh, integral, uh, just a cancellation, the leftover of a cancellation between some much stronger vortices that are actually existing on the surface of the airplane, right? And this lecture will focus on these much stronger vortices that's lying on the surface of the wing, rather than the leftover of the uh, cancellation of these much stronger vortices, all right? And uh, a corollary of the uh, fact that uh, the vortices on the surface is much stronger than the vortices we have been considering previously is that for uh, a lot of the airplane geometries, we can actually consider this geometry as two dimensions. Okay, so that is basically saying that the vorticity on the surface is going to be much stronger than any vorticity that is in the uh, streamwise direction. All right. So if that's the case, basically that allows us to consider the geometry as two-dimensional. So going back uh, to here, right? If the vorticity over here, which induces a velocity in the spanwise direction, is much weaker, the induced velocity in the spanwise direction is much weaker then the induced uh, velocity by the vortices on the surface, then we can consider the whole flow field as two dimension, meaning only having 
uh, X and Z components. All right, make sense? Yes. One question I had is if maybe at some point during the lecture we can see like a worked example of like problem set difficulty of this topic. Uh, can, can you say again? Yeah, um, if at some point during the lecture, like with regard to solving PSEP problems, okay. if you can work through like an, a similar difficulty problem applying these concepts, that would be helpful. Applying the concept of uh, computing induced velocity, like, etc. Yeah, like actually solving a problem. Okay, sounds good. Yes. Again, why is that lift? That uh, why is gamma equal to or what what gamma you solve for? Or, Right, so I'm confused so, so, about that, that, that equality. This equality, yeah. right? So, so basically, this is uh, uh, this is Kudrat-Jankowski theory, right? Uh, saying that uh, actually the derivation of that uh, we are going to see a little bit uh, uh, later today. That is basically saying that uh, uh, if you know the total vorticity, uh, if you know the total integrated vorticity of the circulation around the wing, then you know what is going to be the lift produced per spec. Right, so so just uh, uh, I, I think uh, you should have seen that in unified fluids, but like uh, what we are going to be going over today is. Uh, I think there's a briefly. lot of stuff that we didn't really see. You didn't really see, okay? Yeah. So 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 what? So you, you might have seen this, uh, but you may not have uh, seen a derivation of this, right? So so that's something we are going to be doing today. All right. Okay. So more importantly, like apply it. Like actually used it. Maybe like we'd seen it on a slide, but hadn't actually ever practiced it previous Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so so regarding to the worked out uh, uh, problem of a uh, of an example, right? So uh, so maybe maybe I can do it. Uh, maybe I'll I'll use some time today to to just to work out a. A even more simplified version of uh, what we did in class. Does it make sense to do that? Okay. So, so the even more simplified version of uh, what we uh, what we have in the homework is that uh, if we have a spe if we have a week, right? Again, let me just uh, say aspect ratio of ten. So, um, similar to in our in our homework problem, we are making gross approximations. In the sense that uh, in the homework problem, we are approximating the lift per span, right, as a piecewise constant, uh, as a piecewise constant function, right. In reality, when you have a uh, an airplane of any geometry, the lift per span is going to be influenced not just by the geometry, right, but also by the induced flow, which is a continuous function. So that continuous function is going to make the lift per span not constant, but uh, 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 and you can take into account of that by approximating the lift per span as a finer piecewise constant, right? You can divide the wing into, like, uh, uh, as in this case, into tens of small sections and approximate each of these small sections as constant uh, lift per span, right? But like uh, in the homework problem, in order to make things simpler, we just uh, did the much coarser. Uh, discretization of the lift, lift per span. So in this uh, example, I'm just going to use a uh, even grosser approximation. We'll think about the whole thing, right, as a constant uh, uh, lift per span. So if that's the case, then we know the gamma, the circulation around the whole wing, is going to be constant throughout, right? And uh, uh, which means that uh, da, 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 if we have a circulation going that way, uh, then we'll have the same circulation pointing upstream over here, pointing downstream over here, and pointing across the wing like this. So, uh, as in as a numerical example, right? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute uh, uh, the induced flow on the center of the wing. Okay, and uh, uh, trying to close offer an example of closing the loop. So, so this example, we have a symmetric airfoil, let's say at, uh, uh, let's say three degrees, and let's let's just uh, say at alpha, uh, alpha degrees angle of, uh, of attack, uh, AOA. Okay, so so if we have alpha degrees angle of attack, then we know the lift coefficient is going to be. 
and uh, let's say thin symmetric gel foil so that uh, we know the uh, leaf coefficient is going to be 2 pi times alpha minus alpha induced right make sense okay and if we have a chord length of c then the lift is going to be uh, half of rho v infinity squared times chord length times uh, the span times the cl right which is plugged in over here so that's how much lift we get and uh, as a result of that the gamma we get uh, is going to be is going to be basically uh, the lift over span then divided by rho v infinity sorry uh, squared uh, I should have a squared over here, rho infinity squared, uh, CB, CL, right? And uh, now uh, just to plug in the lift into here, what we get is uh, half of V infinity squared, uh, B gets cancelled, and uh, uh, we have a, okay, V infinity, I think also get cancelled by one of them, and uh, what we get is... Uh, the, the, the gamma equal to rho get cancelled. Uh, C is still here. B gets cancelled. Uh, rho gets cancelled. Uh, I think I just have this times the lift coefficient. Right. Uh, the dimensions are correct. The velocity times length. All right. So so this is a a, a formula that uh, gets the vorticity from CL. Right. Our ultimate goal is to close the system, right? So if we know distribution of distribution of gamma uh, bond, and uh, we are going to be able to get the distribution of gamma trailing, right? In this case, uh, the equations are trivial. So this is the bound vortex and the trailing vortex strength is just equal to the bound vortex strength because there is a single one, right? In your homework, you have to take the difference between the bound vortices to get the strength of the trailing vortices. So that's a, a slightly more complicated but still a linear relationship, right? So, so we get from the uh, trailing vortices and then from the trailing vortices, we get uh, the induced flow, right? And from the induced flow, we get the uh, alpha induced. So alpha induced here. Uh, from there, we get the CL. And from the CL, we get the lift. And uh, from the lift, we get the distribution of the bound vortices. So, so that's the closed loop you are going through in your homework. Right? Does it make sense? Okay, so here uh, we have already completed what? We have completed, uh, uh, if we know the induced alphas, we know uh, CL, right? If we know CL, we know L. So that's, uh, uh, that's from here to here and here to here. And uh, we know the bounded uh, uh, distribution of vortices and we know the trading vortices. Now let's actually complete the remaining two steps. Okay, so the remaining two steps... Uh, so let me just uh, let me just uh, put a number on this. So this is uh, first step from CL uh, from alpha to CL, and the second step from CL to uh, lift, and the third step from L to the distribution of bound vortices, and uh, fourth step from uh, bound vortices to the trailing vortices. And now let's continue. To go from the trailing vortices to the uh, to the downwash. So the downwash, in this case, would be from a combination of these two trailing vortices. So each one offers a, a gamma gamma t over four pi times the half span, right? Multiplied by two. So because there are two vortices, both offering downward flow right so if i uh, i should actually put a minus two here because that's actually downward agreed Sorry, what's the huh yeah that's the downwash the no that that's a velocity the induced wow. velocity so this is induced uh velocity in the in the uh, vertical direction so this is going to be 
step number five. Questions? Yes? Uh, use velocity like at what, like on the, like at any point around the vortex, or how, like, how does that work? Like, because we usually get it as a function of like x, y, z, right? Yes. So it's a function of x, y, z, and in this case, uh, you we are computing the induced velocity at the center of the wing. So in your homework, you need to compute the induced velocity at multiple points, right? And uh, uh, basically, it's going to be using uh, the, the same formula you used in last week's homework except for the FYZ is now discrete locations on top of the wing. And uh, another nice thing is you don't have to consider the bound vortex because the point you are evaluating is on the bound vortex. You only need to consider the uh, trading vortices. Right? But it, the, the more complex thing is that you have to add the contribution of multiple ones, right? So in last week's homework, uh, we only have contribution from the two vortices. And your homework, I think uh, uh, you actually have to consider one, two, so one, two, three, four vortices, right? Because there is a discontinuity of the lift per span over here and over here also, right? So instead of two vortices, you instead of actually three vortices in last week's homework, you consider four vortices. Okay, uh, okay. So so this is the induced flow, and uh, finally uh, we complete uh, the induced flow to alpha. So so the sixth uh, uh, step is that uh, alpha i is going to be equal to the induced flow divided by uh, v infinity, right? So that's the that's a small angle approximation. So uh, essentially, if the induced flow magnitude is much less than the free stream velocity, then like it, it changes the angle of attack by this much, right? So so basically, the downward is this much, and the v infinity is much larger. Then, if you add them together, uh, it results in the deflection of the free stream by angle so the angle is going to be equal to w uh, divided by v infinity okay yes what are the conditions for using this approximation just that v infinity is much bigger yes yes i mean if the general formula if v infinity is not that much greater would be you have to take an arc tangent right but arc tangent is basically equal to uh, this if the if the angle is very small, all right. Okay, so so basically, uh, if you if you combine steps uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, you get a closed equation, right? So uh, in the homework, I think the unknown was set to this uh, uh, gamma, right? Actually, we have two unknown gammas. So if you use these as unknowns, you can express the trailing vortex strength as a function of. Uh, Oh, it's just equal to gamma v in this case. And uh, the downwash is going to be a linear function of gamma. And the alpha is going to be a linear function of gamma. So now if you plug it back over here, the CL is a linear function of gamma, right? And L is going to be a linear function of gamma. And at the end, you are going to see that the gamma itself is going to be a linear function of gamma. So that allows you to right, solve the linear equation to compute what gamma actually is. The only difference is that uh, here we have a single uh, unknown, so we get one linear equation. And in the homework, you should get uh, you have two unknowns, and you should get the uh, two equations, right? Okay. Uh, th does it make sense? Yes. I have a question on uh, uh, the control volume that you put there a while ago. Okay. Uh, like over here, yeah. There, yeah. So you will still have vorticity in the, in the wake. Right? Yes, yeah, so I, I would have vorticity in the wake uh, if, uh, unless I uh, I'm looking at a case where the uh, the lift per span is constant, so that uh, there is only vorticity coming out uh, on the trailing edge. But don't you get like a, band, a boundary layer that continues after the trailing edge? Oh, okay. Very good question. So, do I get a boundary layer that's coming out on the trading edge? 
Yes. So let me actually uh, look into more detail of what the boundary layer is like, right? So so what what uh, so let's say at the end of the airfoil, the velocity is like this, right? Uh, So a little bit uh, downstream, the velocity would be like this. So, so uh, this is basically the merging of the two boundary layers. And so let's just uh, think about uh, this very thin layer uh, after the trailing edge being the only region of non-zero vorticity. Okay. Then what happens? Uh, uh, then let's actually use uh, uh, use Bernoulli's. So if you use Bernoulli's, you can connect uh, exactly the upper side of this viscous region and you draw a, po uh, draw a curve around the air air airfoil and come back to here, right? There is no vorticity on that curve. And as a result, right, even though the flow field is now viscous, you can use Bernoulli's around that curve. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, in for the velocity difference between here and here should be, should be equal, right? So, okay, so so let me first uh, say like uh, uh, the pressure over here and over here should be equal, right? Because uh, uh, because if this is an extremely thin layer, right, then any significant pressure difference would uh, uh, cause the flow to curve at an extremely high curvature, right? So if this is extremely thin, then the pressure over here and over here should be roughly equal. Okay, agree? And as a result, you can use Bernoulli over here and the uh, uh, pressure is equal, that means the velocity above and below should be equal, right? Okay, so now if the velocity is equal, what does that mean for the vorticity over here? For the total vorticity over here, it should actually integrate to zero, right? So, so basically, what this means is that yes, if you zoom microscopically, there is a lot of vorticity over here inside the viscous region, but it's positive over here and then immediately negative immediately adjacent to it. So now, if you think about the, the flow field induced by these vortices that are very close and actually integrate to zero it becomes almost zero, right? So yes, there is vorticity in the wake, but these vortices, because they integrate to zero and they are so close to each other, the effect of the kind of pair the vortices in the wake on the overall flow field is negligible. So that's a, actually a very good point that, uh, uh, yeah, should be actually uh, emphasized. Yes? Is that only true for a constant lift distribution? There the, the shed vortices sort of in the streamwise direction, right? Yes. So this is the this is true for the constant lift direction. Uh, if you uh, if you don't have constant lift, then there is going to be vorticity coming out not just over here but along the whole trading edge. Oh, so you can right. just change the shape of the. Yeah, you can just uh, change the shape of the red part versus uh, uh, yeah versus the that, that connects the red part to the to the green part. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, so, so in this case, if you have non-constant uh, lift per, per span, what happens is that the boundary layers will be three-dimensional. Okay, so uh, what happens is that uh, the flow field on top of the wing, uh, because uh, yeah, because of the because of the circulation, right? On top of the wing, the flow is going to go slightly inward, and at the bottom of the wing, the flow is going to go slightly outward. So uh, over here and over here, the velocity, the direction of the velocity is going to be slightly different. So even though the magnitude of velocity here and here are the same, but the direction is going to be slightly different. As a result, the vorticity integrates even, uh, the velocity is still integrates to zero in this direction, but it won't integrate to zero in that direction. All right. All right, so this is, uh, Oh, I, I'm getting to some uh, more complicated stuff than I intended to uh, go into, but like uh, this is uh, all of this basically uh, simplifies to the fact that 
but, but no matter no matter if this is three dimensional or not, right? The vorticity in the spanwise direction is a lot stronger than vorticity that comes out uh, in in the wake in the x direction. So basically, today we are going to only consider uh, the vorticity that is aligned in the spanwise direction and simplify the problem into two dimensions. All right. Okay. So. Uh, maybe today we're just going to kind of go into the gist of what we are going to do. Okay, so what we are going to do today is basically think about what is the flow field of uh, superpositioning a uni uniform flow with a vortex. So previously we have seen that in in uh, in the incompressible potential flow, right? We can add two flow fields that satisfies the equations and the sum of the two flow fields. By the way, by sum of the two flow fields, I mean the sum of the velocity fields, not the pressure field. Okay, the sum of the velocity field is still a valid incompressible potential flow fields. And after you add them up, you can recalculate the pressure using Bernoulli's, which is in general not equal to the sum of the pressure from the two flow fields. Okay. Right. So uh, today, let's actually uh, do it a little bit uh, uh, by adding a uniform flow with a vortex. So a uniform flow basically means uh, a u infinity, and uh, if we assume the flow field is aligned in the x-axis, then we get u infinity zero. Right. And a vortex, uh, if we are looking at Basically, let's only look at the x, z direction. So, so y velocity, let's assume, is all zero. Okay, and uh, the uh, a vortex flow field is, uh, let's say, in the x direction, is going to be z divided by uh, x squared plus z squared. So, let's imagine we have a vortex that sits exactly on the origin. Okay, and uh, the the x-axis would be gamma over 2 pi uh, times z over x squared plus z squared. So it's a flow field that at positive z, the x uh, velocity would be positive. And uh, uh, the z velocity would be gamma over 2 pi 2, but with a negative sign of x divided by x squared plus z squared, right? As you can see that uh, the magnitude of this velocity field is actually right. You have a the uh, on the numerator you have a vector that's z minus x. On the denominator you have square of the distance to the origin, right? So if you divide the magnitude of the uh, numerator, which is the distance, by the square distance on the denominator, you get one over r uh, magnitude, right? That's what a vortex flow field uh, looks like. So. So this is uh, in the x direction, uh, this is uh, ux, and this is uz, okay? Now let's think about the pressure field. What is the pressure field of the uniform flow? It's uniform, right? There is uh, no reason for the pressure to change. Actually, if the pressure changes, then there is either a uh, there is a pressure force in some direction that's going to either make the velocity magnitude not constant or make the velocity direction not constant. So P equal to A constant. Let's just uh, call it P infinity. How about the vortex flow field? What is the pressure like? Well, we have seen that uh, the vortex flow field, I think we derived uh, uh, previously, right? So, so a vortex, uh, basically, this vortex field flow field is a limit of the ranking vortex when the viscous core goes to zero, right? So, and we have seen previously that outside of the viscous core, the pressure goes like one over square of the radius, right? So, basically, this is, uh, uh, this is going to be yeah, actually, we can also take just to use uh, uh, Bernoulli's, and uh, this is minus half of a uh, square, half of rho times the square of the uh, velocity magnitude. 
right? So that's is equal to let's say p infinity minus this, right? So these are the flow field of this. These are the pressure field of these two flow fields. And now we know that after adding them, so combine combine them, the velocity field becomes u infinity plus gamma over 2 pi z divided by x squared plus z squared in the x direction and in the z direction it stays the same because the uniform flow has no component in the z direction. Now the question is what is the flow field like? What is the pressure field like? Is the pressure field just the sum of these two pressure fields? No, right? So this is uh, this comes from the fact that the Bernoulli's law is not linear, right? The Bernoulli's law contains the square of the velocity. As a result of that, even though by adding to velocity field you get a valid flow field, the pressure cannot get by just adding the pressure fields. You have to actually apply Bernoulli's law again on the new velocity field, right? Which is actually not obvious from here but like let's actually do a little bit of uh, uh, numerics and uh, see uh, in this one in this uh, numerical uh, demonstration what uh, the summation of a uniform flow with a vortex is like okay so here let's actually change the strength of the vortex uh, to in this case uh, I think the, the positive uh, the vortex goes out of the board and uh, let's actually make a, a negative vortex. So a negative vortex would uh, basically make the flow go uh, go faster at above and uh, uh, slower below, right? So can somebody just infer from the flow field where the maximum pressure and the minimum pressure is over here. Yes? Maximum pressure is probably like slightly below, I think, to the left of the vortex. Um, and you can infer that because the flow like comes to almost stagnation. That right. One. Right. Uh, you want to say something? No, okay. So yes, so so the maximum uh, pressure actually is where the minimum velocity is. Right, by Bernoulli's law. And if you look at the minimum velocity, it's like here, where the flow almost stagnates. And that's actually uh, is exactly calculatable from the velocity field, right? Okay, the, the minimum velocity field is when both are equal to zero. And here, in the z direction, the flow field of uh, the velocity equal to zero when x is equal to zero, right? That's simple. While on the x direction, the velocity would be equal to zero when z, right, is slight, it's, ne it's, it's negative enough, right, to make uh, the u infinity and this term exactly cancel. So if you go back to the flow field, right, x is equal to zero, so on this line, right, and z is just enough so that the two velocities cancel each other. All right, and uh, so on these streamlines, where do you see the velocity being the fastest? Yeah, just above. Uh, just above, right, over here. So here would have the minimum pressure. Right. Okay, so this is now an interesting example where if you are able to draw, uh, I can draw over here, if you're able to draw a geometry that is like, like this, right? If you draw a geometry that follows the streamline like this, you would actually be drawing the flow field around that solid body that's almost like a inverted uh, uh, droplet shape okay and uh, this geometry would have a stagnation point over here 
have the velocity going faster above it, and as a result, the pressure very low above it, and the pressure very high below it. This is a lifting body. Okay, make sense? So, the flow field around a single vortex is actually a lifting body. So, this is just a, uh, the first thing we learned. Now, if you can duplicate this, uh, make it, uh, make it uh, let's see, the same Y, but uh, slightly different X. Okay, make two vortices. You would see that, again, you're going to get a lifting body, but of different shape, right? So, again, you're going to get uh, uh, the flow field going faster above it, and uh, uh, there is going to be a more kind of a heart-shaped uh, geometry over here. This is going to be the stagnation point, right? And uh, uh, you're going to get a different geometry, but also lifting. Now, what you can do is you can add the more and more different uh, vortices, and that's going to give you different uh, geometries that's lifting, right? So, so what we are going to be looking at uh, uh, in the next class is we are going to be doing the inverse problem of this one. So we are going to be figure out if somebody gives me an airfoil at a certain degree angle of attack, what is the best way to construct a series of vortices that would make the flow field exactly follow the contour of the airfoil? And then from this distribution of vortices, I can use Bernoulli's to figure out what is the flow velocity just on the surface of the airfoil, right? And from the velocity, we can know where is low pressure regions, where are high pressure regions. And by integrating the pressure distribution on the surface, we get the lift, we get the drag, right? We can also get the moment. And that's what we are going to be doing, of combining um, the, the constraint of the geometry and its relation to the distribution of vorticity, a plus Bernoulli's, which relates the distribution of vorticity to the pressure, right? By combining these, we will analyze what is the uh, lift, drag, and the moments on airfoils. And that will also uh, give you the, the, the law that relates the total circulation to the lift uh, produced. All right, okay, so see you on Wednesday. <laughs> Oh yes, please. Uh, so we have an announcement. Uh, so yeah, let's yeah. So my name is Trevor. I'm gonna help out uh, with Chi Chi and doing office hours. Um, I'll let Chi Chi know in the next, like at the end of today, when I'll do office hours. Um, I'll also be helping out with the labs later in the semester. So um, you can use me as a resource. I'll give my contact to Chi Chi. He'll bless it out. Yeah. So if you can add me as well. Class. Sure, I, I will do that. So Trevor is very nice to offer help with the class because I, I had a really hard time finding a, a qualified TA this semester for some reason, but uh, although Trevor is uh, funded by other sources, uh, uh, he offered to help. So thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. And yes? Um, professor, this is a quick question for PSETs. Uh, would it be possible to release the PSET solutions for the previous PSETs? Yes, I already released it for PSET 1, and I'll release it for PSET 2 uh, later this week. Okay. All right. Yeah, so what's the um, approximate uh, spacing of the PSETs? I mean, I guess I'll see on the, um, on the right. site, but what are you, 